All right, next up we have Paul Barford. Paul, here he comes. Paul was unfortunately a uh, victim of the ice storm in Atlanta last time, and we uh, convinced him to stick with us and uh, make it to Bellevue. So thank you very much, Paul. All right, well, um, after support from the uh, organizing committee, I'm very happy to be back here to speak to this group today uh, about a project that we've had uh, going on at Wisconsin for the past couple of years. Uh, this is exactly the group that I've been eager to talk to for quite some time because uh, sort of squirreled away in our academic setting and talking to other academics, we have a certain perspective on connectivity um, that may or may not be um, congruent with the perspective that this group has, so I'm very eager for feedback on, uh, on our work. So the general aspect that we're interested in is understanding physical topology of the Internet. And of course, uh, when the Internet was first invented, uh, way back when, and for a period of time after that, there were lots of napkin drawings and other representations that were probably pretty accurate in terms of um, the node locations and physical conduits that facilitated connectivity. However, sometime in the 80s, and probably people in this room have a better perspective of it than I do, um, things grew to a level of complexity where it became impossible to um, have any one entity have a comprehensive understanding of what the infrastructure from a global perspective actually look like. And while we draw fun diagrams like the one um, on the right here, the famous Peacock diagram, um, of course we know that those don't have any real basis. In fact, they're very pretty, but, um, but they don't necessarily relate to uh, the actual nodes and links that comprise the internet today. So the objectives of the, the work that we've undertaken are to create a catalog, a comprehensive database of what I'll call the physical internet. Uh, the physical internet being defined as the geographic locations of infrastructure, nodes that house um, routing and switching equipment, and the physical links that connect those nodes together. So this is not the layer three uh, based maps that a lot of people, especially in academia, have spent a lot of time trying to understand, but nodes of the actual physical infrastructure. Beyond the physical infrastructure, then our ob objective is to take a constructive approach of adding metadata to that uh, repository, uh, metadata including IP addresses, the ability to augment um, that made it metadata with um, actual capability to emit active probes from those locations to include uh, information like BGP updates and then also to include uh, pieces of information that may not necessarily immediately be obvious but based on the, uh, the ability to uh, ascribe a geographic location to that data things like uh, weather reports or earthquake reports or um, other things, uh, we'd like to build this comprehensive repository. Um, beyond simply gathering the data, uh, the objective of the project is to actually produce a portal that allows the data to be visualized and analyzed. And then ultimately, since we're uh, a research entity, to finally take the step of applying the maps that we've put together to uh, research problems of interest, right? So if, you, if you've ever read a paper about uh, internet topology, it always starts out with some kind of preamble like the need to understand physical structure is, you know, can be applied to uh, understanding application performance, robustness, blah, blah, blah. Well, we'd actually like to start to, uh, to use the maps to address those problems. So Probably uh, many people in the room are related uh, or are uh, familiar with uh, related work in this area. Um, maybe some of you uh, remember the Sean Gorman storm story. Anybody remember that story from about 10 years ago? Yeah, one or two people. Uh, if you haven't read that story, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, this was a, 
an effort that's uh, very much like ours that resulted in uh, kind of a breathless set of articles that were published in uh, the Washington Post um, about how could anybody uh, possibly think that putting together a repository of the connection infrastructure of the internet could be anything other than a uh, horrible security uh, problem waiting to happen. And um, uh, long story short, um, Mr. Gorman was allowed to publish his thesis that was based on this, um, but aspects of the thesis were actually classified and he had to finish his work in a, in a SCIF facility and it was a little, a little crazy at the time. Uh, there have been uh, related efforts, uh, especially organized around gathering measurements using layer three techniques uh, at CADA uh, in Israel, the Dimes Project, and uh, right across the street here at, uh, at UW in the iPlane Project. And of course, there are the commercial activities, the, the relevant commercial activities from the, uh, from the groups that are listed. The other project that's most related to ours is the Internet Topology Zoo effort that's uh, been carried out at University of Adelaide in Australia. So what does it take to compile a physical repository of the Internet? Well, first and foremost, we, we rely on search to find maps of the physical locations of infrastructure. And while I'm guessing that most of the people in the room here who are responsible for uh, operation, maintenance, and uh, development of physical infrastructure are not big proponents of publishing maps of that infrastructure. Uh, the folks in your sales group love to have maps of physical infrastructure. So we use uh, a variety of, we've become very facile in developing search terms to identify um, maps of, uh, of networks. Um, we've gathered uh, thousands of these maps over the last couple of years. And then uh, what happens after that is the very, very tedious process of transcribing those maps into uh, a GIS database. Um, so while we've tried very hard to automate that process to the extent possible because of the wide variety of representations, both in terms of how the maps are actually uh, presented, whether they're uh, a flash application or a PNG or some other kind of representation. Uh, there's a lot of variation in what we've found. And at the end of the day, we have to default to um, manual transcription. Uh, the good news is that undergraduates are uh, very inexpensive and are very happy to have uh, $10 an hour kinds of jobs for these things. So we, uh, we employ them as needed to, uh, to, to do this trans transcription project. Um, unfortunately, under undergraduates are sort of universally sleepy people. And when it comes to actual transcription, you can, you can actually stand behind them and watch them make errors when they do these, these transcriptions. So the process of verifying the data that's actually entered into the database is likewise tedious and something that we, we pay a lot of attention to. At the end of the day, if we're, if we're entering data that's wrong, wrong meaning an incorrect reflection of the maps that we've actually found, then obviously the data is, uh, is useless. So this sounds like a, a sort of a, a horrible effort in terms of scope, but the fact of the matter is that the number of physical locations in terms of POPs and conduits that uh, are, de are deployed across the globe is, uh, is, is much smaller than the number of IP addresses and so forth that are deployed across the globe. So um, while this is a big undertaking, uh, maybe at some level it's tractable and certainly the, um, the development of new infrastructure takes place at a, nut, uh, at a, at a much lower pace than um, than deployment, let's say, of new systems and, and new configurations of systems. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of maps here that you're probably all very familiar with, but the fact is that when you start digging into um, uh, maps that you can find in search, uh, the number and variety of representations just, just kind of boggles the mind. And uh, so you, you, you find maps like this one of uh, Telstra. Actually, my favorite map and the one that I always use in talks for smaller bodies is the, is the great uh, representation of level three. Are there people in the room here from level three? Probably somebody, maybe not willing to raise your hand. Anyway, 
your, uh, your, your network map is beautiful, and the thing that I love the most about it is that when you drill down on level, three map, level three's maps to the finest grain, what you can see is that their links are, have actually been geocoded. And this is not something that we see in many maps. So if I go, for example, to Sprint's map, um, here is a case where the, uh, the links are not geocoded and the locations of the infrastructure are simply given as cities, okay, which is not nearly as useful as a lat lawn or a, uh, an actual street address. So in everything that we've had to do when it comes to creating this repository, we've had to develop different techniques to uh, regularize the data that we put into the database. Ultimately, we love street addresses. And street addresses, of course, are available from uh, certain infrastructures, like level threes, for example, um, but not from others. So in, in cases where we can't find a street address, we will simply uh, place a pop in the centroid of a city, or if there are uh, locations of infrastructure that have street addresses, we will sometimes uh, simply bind a, uh, uh, what would otherwise be a location in, uh, fixed to the centroid of a city to an existing pop. And of course, all of this is labeled in the database. Of course, for infrastructure where we have information about services, um, oftentimes that's uh, accompanied with these maps. So, um, you know, IP services or voice services or other types of services will include that metadata uh, in our database as well. Um, one of the things, so here's an example of, of a regional fiber layout in the state of Illinois. Um, and uh, one of the things that we have recognized is that while labels are often not included in maps, if you uh, consider infrastructure along with other representations, for example, rail and highway, you can oftentimes uh, geocode uh, links with that uh, existing infrastructure. So for example, there is a path here that goes from uh, Chicago uh, down the sort of the right central um, portion of uh, the state of Illinois. I happen to grow up in that area, so I know very well that that is actually following um, Interstate 57. And in cases where we can match uh, network infrastructure with existing physical infrastructure, we will add uh, those labels as appropriate. Okay, so we, we have drawn the line at, uh, at, at city level, level fiber layouts. Um, I'm sure that many of you are aware that these kinds of city level uh, fiber uh, layouts are, are actually available uh, for certain large cities in particular. Of course, uh, again, the motivation for this is that the sales folks uh, want businesses in those areas to see that they have the ability to connect to your infrastructure in a very straightforward fashion. This is uh, downtown uh, Chicago. Uh, we have not endeavored to um, add these kinds of details to uh, our database. Um, if you think that adding uh, nodes and links on a sort of a national or regional level is tedious, doing uh, street level fiber is incredibly tedious in the, in the mapping infrastructure that we've developed. So we have these maps, we just haven't included them in the database. So our, uh, our effort began um, in September of 2011. Um, we have uh, endeavored to be uh, broadly focused in terms of the data that we've gathered. We've developed uh, different methods for uh, regathering maps from uh, URLs that we've um, entered into the database and to the extent possible to automate the verification of maps that are in the database versus recently crawled maps. Uh, we have built um, a comprehensive web portal based on uh, ISRI's uh, ArcGIS, which is the canonical um, uh, GIS tool um, used broadly in many different uh, disciplines. And uh, the benefit of ArcGIS is that in addition to giving us some nice flexibility in terms of um, visualization, and analysis that enables us to very easily uh, include different data sets that have been developed um, in different areas. So we had a paper in the uh, SIGCOM Hot Planet workshop uh, last fall that describes uh, Atlas 
If you want to take a look at it, um, I encourage you to do so. I'm going to give you the URL for the portal um, at the end of the talk, and you know, I'm eager to uh, to get your feedback on it. Um, let me just say quickly too that the way that we've set the system up, um, we are trying to pay attention to uh, security. Right now, I'm the uh, I'm I'm the key, <laughs> so you can get a a very very cursory view of the portal uh, without credentials. Um, if you want to actually look at the full view um, of the system, you need to send a, a request to me uh, to get those credentials. We don't give out the raw data right now, um, but uh, but you know, eager to have people, especially from this group, take a look and to help us understand how we can make the portal uh, more useful for you or if it's useful in any way uh, for you right now. So the, uh, the current archive uh, as it stands is that we have nearly 400 networks um, included. Um, we have uh, included uh, over 2,000 data center locations, NTP servers, uh, DNS servers, IXPs. Uh, we have um, getting close to uh, 15,000 uh, nodes from different networks in terms of unique locations of nodes, uh, nearly 8,000. Uh, the total number of links in the archive uh, is nearing 14,000. And recently we've begun to expand uh, the scope of the networking related data to include uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, um, uh, cell towers, and, and so forth. So here's a, a snapshot of the, uh, of, the, of the full view of the current archive uh, that you can get from the portal, uh, including both nodes and links. We actually, if you're familiar with GIS, GIS is a visualization capability based on the notion of layering. So we actually have quite a few different layers uh, in the database right now. Um, including all of the different uh, networking um, data and um, uh, weather reports. Um, we, we have uh, road and rail infrastructure and can easily add different layers of uh, different types of data, again, because of the fact that we've built this all on, uh, on ArcGIS. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears to uh, the second half of my talk now and um, spend a few minutes telling you about a study that we, um, that we had published at the end of the last, last year, end of 2013, in the ACM Conex conference. And this is one of the first um, applications of uh, the Atlas database to um, a problem that I'm going to assume that many in this room um, have had, and I'm eager to understand uh, what techniques various, you know, various groups in, in the room use to address it, which is um, understanding uh, how to equip your infrastructures to deal with, uh, with issues of uh, outages that, that are potentially caused by natural disasters. So um, in this study, we're, we're seeking answers to uh, a couple of questions which is how can uh, we automatically adjust routes to avoid outages before they happen, so generally to improve robustness. Another way of saying this is if you had to add one link to your infrastructure to improve robustness from natural uh, disaster outages, where would you add it? So that's a question that we, we seek to address. And then also to uh, consider a real-time application of this capability, namely, as a threat is evolving, so think about, for example, a hurricane, how can routes be uh, established that lower the risk of outages in the face of that kind of a threat? So to answer this question, uh, we developed the notion of uh, bit risk miles, a metric that we call bit risk miles. And the idea behind bit risk miles is to, um, is to consider several different components in the form of a single metric that enables us to make these kinds of assessments versus, uh, versus standard shortest path routing. So generally the notion of a bit risk mile is to include uh, the bits sent or a proxy for bits, bits sent, which I'll talk about in a minute, plus the distance between two points, plus the risk of outage 
of either the endpoints or um, the link between endpoints, and that's what we mean by bit risk miles. So you consider a path, a path being composed of multiple hops between two nodes, then uh, the notion that we develop captured in the formula at the bottom of this slide is that we uh, consider the distance along with uh, the risk uh, and um, the, the number of bits sent on the path. Okay, so the idea here really is that what this gives us the, is, is the ability to quantify the trade-offs between a shortest path between two uh, nodes that might have a higher aspect of risk versus a longer path between those two nodes uh, that has a lower risk of outage. Okay, so I'm going to um, define a couple of terms in the prior uh, equation, and the terms are as follows. One is that we have, uh, as I say, this number of bits sent, which is essentially the cost of an outage if an outage takes place. Well, we don't know the number of bits that are being sent uh, over any particular link at any time. This is something that, of course, you would have um, uh, information about. So what we do to approximate this value is we use the fraction of population that might be affected by uh, an outage, uh, meaning the fraction of prop population that's actually clustered around um, a particular pop. Secondly, we consider actually two aspects of risk uh, in this study. One is the uh, historical probability of outage, so this is a static notion. And we consider this using a corpus of events that, we've, uh, that we gathered from uh, FEMA and NOAA over a period of uh, 40 years. So this is, um, of course, available to anyone. But one of the nice things about these uh, data archives is that they give uh, detailed information about the particular geographic locations in which the events took place. And then we also include a dynamic component which is the forecasted probability for, uh, of, of risk uh, as it relates to physical locations in the path of, uh, again, think of a tornado or, uh, or, or a hurricane. Um, and this would, this, would, this would be information that would be available um, from the National Weather Service or Na National Hurricane Center in terms of an evolving threat. So what we've developed uh, in Risk Root is uh, essentially an optimization framework that allows one to identify and, and assess the trade-offs between distance and uh, bit risk miles. Um, I make uh, statements here about current techniques um, based solely on what I've read in the literature and, and sort of not based on your operational experience. So, We'll be interested in uh, hearing your feedback uh, again about how you uh, manage these issues. Um, of course, storing all um, backup paths is, is probably not something that is uh, feasible. So what our framework allows is a comparison, or, or the way that we apply it in the paper is by comparison, a comparison between uh, simply shortest paths between two nodes and the, uh, the expanded path that's identified uh, to lower risk through our optimization framework. So um, to consider this uh, for the purpose of the paper, we looked at the, um, the network infrastructure for seven large ISPs and six, 16 regional ISPs in the United States. This is something that gives us, or our framework gives us the ability to consider uh, intra as well as inter-domain routing. I'm gonna wave my hands a little bit at uh, inter-domain routing because I do not know the details of uh, every single one of the um, routing peers that exist in these networks. So we made certain assumptions about that uh, based on the data that we had available, obviously, uh, our framework can be applied in your setting using your detailed knowledge of that. And what we're interested in, in, in terms of the study, is assessing uh, two different features. One is the ability to reduce the amount of risk uh, by adding additional paths. 
using the risk, risk root frame, framework versus the distance that winds up the expansion and distance between the, port, um, between the two points that is a result of uh, adding these additional paths. So this is a, a slide um, that I'm not going to spend a, a huge amount of time on, but um, basically from the uh, intradomain perspective, um, there are a couple of sort of take-home messages that I want you to have because obviously the, the uh, networks, the 23 networks that we considered uh, for this study all have sort of different characteristics in terms of their proximity to historically risky areas and uh, in terms of the richness of their connectivity, in terms of the uh, uh, full geographic foot, their footprint and, and so forth. And the, the sort of the take home here um, is not going to be maybe particularly um, earth shattering if, if you think about it, but basically the graphs on the left side of this uh, uh, um, uh, slide uh, tell the following story. For networks that have a larger geographical footprint, they tend to be more robust to internet outages than those that have a small geographical footprint. And generally, networks that have um, a larger number of POPs, namely richer connectivity within their infrastructures, are more robust to outages and wind up having um, less path expansion in the dynamic case uh, than those that have a fewer number of POPs. On the contrary, and the graph in the upper right is somewhat mis mislabeled there. It shouldn't say average router degree. It should say average pop degree. Um, just because uh, you increase um, the amount of connections at a particular pop doesn't necessarily mean that you've reduced um, the bit risk miles. And likewise, by simply by increasing the number of peers for a particular network doesn't necessarily mean that you've, uh, that you've helped yourself either. Okay, the last uh, result slide actually in the paper, um, there are a lot more results uh, about how to apply risk root. Just emphasize again that it's a, it's a general optimization framework to help to identify where and how backup paths can be, uh, can be included in your network. Uh, this slide represents a, uh, a um, a set of results that show for a particular set of networks how adding the most optimal backup path within those infrastructures can help to reduce bit miles, uh, bit risk. And uh, what it shows is that, in fact, uh, level three, given its large footprint and rich connectivity, um, has the smallest impact by adding the most optimal uh, link between two nodes in their infrastructure. Okay, so they're doing pretty well. Um, but on the other hand, a couple of the other networks, uh, Sprint and, and so forth, could potentially increase their robustness by adding additional links in their infrastructure following the, uh, the risk root technique. Okay, so this is a little animation just for fun of Katrina and level three and how level three could have adjusted uh, its roots uh, based on uh, the risk root framework. So what you see here, of course, is the, uh, the footprint of Level 3's infrastructure, the path of Katrina, and then the, uh, the, the uh, highlighted path is the one uh, between two um, selected nodes in the infrastructure, the nodes that had the highest bit risk as the hurricane advanced, and how paths might have been uh, um, augmented in order to uh, reduce bit risk during that event. So this is a demonstration of the dynamic capability of risk group. All right, so next steps, um, we're working hard to continue to populate the database. Uh, as I say, we currently have around uh, 400 networks in the database right now. All the big ones are easy. Um, the, the hardest networks are the, the you know, local and regional networks. We have, as, as I say, a large archive of maps. And I've got, uh, hopefully, a small army of, uh, of undergraduates this summer who are going to be working on making those additions. Um, 
the re really the hardest uh, task that we face from the long-term perspective of making this a worldwide compendium is that neither my Russian nor my Chinese is particularly good. And um, in order to uh, identify maps in other parts of the world, uh, there, there may well be language components there that we'll have to consider um, in our search. Um, we're spending a lot of time uh, working on the web portal um, and uh, in terms of expanding and making its capability more robust. We're very interested in um, uh, developing new techniques for adding metadata to the portal. And, uh, and, and one of the recent things that we've added that we hope is uh, potentially useful for this group is, uh, is the ability to um, actually run active probe-based measurements, ping, trace route, and, uh, and a, a tool that we also developed called Path Audit um, along uh, using uh, connections to 850 different, uh, different endpoints across the globe. Uh, Planet Lab makes up a large percent of that, but, uh, but looking glass servers do as well. And, um, and one of the things that just becomes very clear is that our lack of ability to do good uh, IP geolocation really limits some of the visualization capability uh, that we have in the portal now. So we're going to be spending more time on IP geolocation as, as we move forward. Okay, that concludes my talk. Only 25 seconds over, so pretty good timing. Uh, here is the URL for the portal. Uh, please take a look. Um, if there are those of you who are interested uh, in accounts, uh, send me email, uh, pb at cs.wisc.edu, and um, hopefully we've got time for a question or two. Thank you. People are hungry. Hi, Ralph. It on. Ralph Mullen, Internet Archive. Are you interested in crowdsourcing input uh, regarding infrastructure and outages? Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've talked about that. So um, on the, the database slide that I showed, um, we are actually beginning to include information from wiggle.net, which is a crowdsourced uh, uh, portal. Um, so yeah, the answer, I, I, I think the, the, the straight answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, we'll be breaking for lunch now. We have a welcome lunch next door here, co-sponsored by Comcast and Juniper. And uh, in the Regency Ballroom, we have the Newcomers Lunch, sponsored by VeriSign, where uh, we'll have a little more content in there, help uh, direct newcomers how to get the most out of the conference. Thank you very much. See you back at 1 o'clock.